Good evening, everybody. I'm Brett Martinez, President and CEO of Redwood Credit Union. Welcome to our webinar, Finding Financial Resilience in Uncertain Times with Gene Chatsky. Thank you all for joining us, and I'm sure you will all agree uncertain times is, is, is the topic of the day. As many of you know, Redwood Credit Union is a not-for-profit financial cooperative, and our mission is to passionately serve the best interests of our members, our employees, and our communities. Our webinar tonight is in support of all of you, our members, and our communities. I'm going to wait on our uh, results of our poll here uh, in a few minutes, let some more people take that poll. I do appreciate you guys joining us. We've been through a lot. I think all of you can agree on that, that uh, even prior to this pandemic, and the recent fires and power outages that we're having right now, that was not in the plan when we scheduled this. But as a community, we're extremely resilient. I think all of you know that, and facing challenges isn't something new to us. However, these multiple disasters have had a negative impact on our emotional and our financial wellness. Many times, those two are completely linked together. And through it all, RCU has always been there for our more than 366,000 members and our 700 plus employees and the multiple North Bay communities that we serve. And I commit to you that we will always be there for you no matter what. The recent fires and power outages have added another layer of stress we are all experiencing, certainly the weather outside and today was the weirdest of them all. But it's why I would wanna bring up something else about uh, in June, we did a 60 minute webinar uh, we broadcasted and it focused on self care and stress management. Please check out our RCU YouTube channel. It's a resource that I know I have gone back to a few different times myself for refreshers and reminders. It's been very, very helpful. But tonight we're going to focus on that other critical need, financial wellness and resiliency. So let's get started. Over the next 45 minutes or so, Gene will cover seven things to know about your finances right now to make positive change that will have a lasting impact for years to come. We'll finish up our time together by answering some questions we've been hearing from our membership, and I'll be sharing some RCU resources that might, you might find helpful. With that, we're about to begin the presentation, but before we do, I hope that you're able to slow down for a minute, take a deep breath, and give the next 60 minutes to yourself as a gift. I think you and your finances are worth it. I know life is busy and sometimes we multitask to the point we really can't focus what's right in front of us. That would be me. So I'm asking you to not be me and give yourself this time to focus on the presentation in your financial wellness. I know that you will benefit from it if you do. I do want to uh, cover our uh, polling numbers. Uh, we have about 90% uh, members and about 10% uh, non-members. So I want to thank the members for joining us and uh, welcome the uh, non-members. And I think it's important to understand where everybody, everybody's at. Um, it's actually relatively good news. We've got 5% that uh, aren't really keeping up with expenses. Things are getting worse. 10% uh, keeping up with expenses and the situation is holding steady and keeping up with expenses and maintaining some savings, 35%. And looks like about 65% of people are doing relatively well. Is that 65%? Yes, okay. So that's actually, actually good news here. So without further ado, let me introduce our presenter, Gene Chatsky. This is actually the fourth time that uh, we've invited Gene out to speak in person to our community. And though this time is a little bit different, she's on video, she's actually uh, streaming in from her place in New York, it really feels more important than ever. I do realize that Gene needs very little introduction, uh, but please allow me to share just a few of the highlights. She is the CEO of HerMoney.com and host of the podcast Her Money with Gene Chatsky. She's the financial editor of NBC Today for 25 years and the financial ambassador for AARP. She appears frequently on CNN, MSNBC, and has been a reoccurring guest on The Oprah Winfrey Show. She is a New York Times and Wall Street Journal bestselling author. 
Her latest book is Women With Money, The Judgment-Free Guide to Creating the Joyful, Less Stressed, Purposeful, and Yes Rich Life You Deserve. You can learn more about Jean at jeanchatsky.com. With that, here's Jean to help us with financial wellness and resiliency through these uncertain times. Jean, thank you for joining us. Well, Brett, thank you so much for having me. It is a pleasure to be back with you at Redwood. I cannot imagine what you all are going through. I, I, um, I have friends in, in the area and I've seen pictures throughout the day and I'm just um, astonished that we've got a crowd here tonight. So thank you everybody for, for taking the time to show up to focus on your finances. And let me just say that if you hear any screams from the background in my house, there's nothing wrong here. It's just that I have a, a husband who is a Celtics fan and they're in double overtime. So um, I, I've, I've boarded myself up in, in, a, in a bedroom upstairs, which is the quietest place that, that I could absolutely find. I'm going to share my screen with you because I, I brought some slides along. And, and we're going to talk, as, as Brett said, um, we're going to talk about resilience. Um, let's see. Let me just get that to... Play. There we go. Okay. We are going to start by talking about resilience. And I was going to start by talking about this guy. Um, this guy, by the way, is, is Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison, many of you know, was a prolific inventor, America's best inventor, greatest inventor, many people say. He invented film. He invented motion pictures. He invented the carbon microphone. He invented the mimeograph. He invented so many things that you would think that this guy had it really easy. But there is this famous story about how difficult it was for him to come up with a working solution for the incandescent light source. A, a reporter, from the New York Times actually asked him if he felt like a failure after hundreds of unsuccessful attempts to make a light bulb. And Edison said, I have not failed hundreds of times. I have succeeded in proving those hundreds of ways won't work. Edison had resilience, which is defined as the ability to recover from or adjust easily to misfortune or to change. But I have to say that after reading about and hearing from Brett about everything that you all are going through, that as much resilience as Edison had, I suspect that you and members of your community have even more. Um, the, the grit and determination that it has taken to just walk through everyday life is really, really something. And my heart goes out to every single one of you. Um, but I think we have to remember that, that we have to hold on to this, that, that resilience is paramount because people who have long-lasting resilience can overcome. Um, they can overcome on the job, they can overcome in their personal lives, they can overcome in their communities, and they can overcome with their finances. They don't deny that bad things happen in all of our lives because, of course, bad things happen in all of our lives. But these people people with resilience are able to continue to move forward rather than getting stuck in some pool of negativity. And the good news, maybe the best news about resilience is that you don't have to be born with it. What we know from research is that people are born with about half the resilience that they're ever going to get. But the other 50% is up to us. We we can learn it. And the way we learn to be more resilient is by focusing on controlling those things that we can control and letting go of the others and by taking action. 
And so that's exactly what we are going to focus on tonight by talking about seven money moves that I want you all to consider making right now. The first one on the list is just an assessment. Think for a second about what you do when you get up every morning. Maybe you check your phone. I know that's the first thing that I do, but also I might hit the treadmill, make the coffee, hop in the shower, but we all do something else and we probably do it more than once. We look in the mirror. Why do we do that? We do it because we know inherently that there is value to this process of self-evaluation. So we look in the mirror, we evaluate, we fix our hair, we adjust. And yet when it comes to our finances, many of us are simply too scared to just look in the mirror. We don't open our statements. We don't want to see where we are. But we can't move forward until we understand not only what this crisis has done to our finances, but what it will continue to do. And that means knowing from the perspective of your household how much is coming in, how much is going out, where is it going, that's important, and how has that changed since before the crisis? There, there's an old saying that I love, whatever gets measured gets managed. This crisis has thrust all of us into management mode, but in order to manage well, we need data on where the money is actually going. Importantly, and the survey results that we just came up with tonight bear this out, Brett tells me that financially, when they look in the aggregate, the members of Redwood are doing better now than at the start of the pandemic. You have more in savings, you have less in debt, and 75% of the people who requested payment deferrals didn't actually need to use them. That's fabulous news. And so if you have been reluctant to look in the mirror, the picture may be better than you anticipate. One particular thing to pay attention to is whether there is a substantial and separate pot of cash to cover emergencies. Personally, I think three to six months worth of emergency savings is ideal. That's three months for a two income family, six months for a single income family. And I understand that for some of you, that may sound like a lot right now, particularly because so many small businesses have shut down and so many furloughs have become permanent layoffs. But one thing that this crisis has reiterated to me, and I expect to many of you, is that a fully funded emergency stash is not an option. It has to be a priority because emergencies happen. And so if you have an emergency stash and you need to use it, use it. That's what it's for. This is an emergency. But then focus on rebuilding it as this crisis passes. And if you've never had one before, I like how the Build Your Own Savings account at Redwood allows you to monitor your progress to the goal, the individual goal that you set for yourself. Start funding this account with automatic transfers of whatever size you can afford on a regular basis. And if you have um, no immediate need for any future stimulus payments that might be coming down the pike or any tax refunds that you have yet to receive this year, both of those make really good starters for emergency cushions. Second money move on the list is to adjust. The information that we gathered in step one gives us a list of to-dos, essentially, for step 
too. Now, it's important to recognize for everybody who is still staying at home that our spending is a whole lot different today than it was in January. Grocery sales are way up. So are home meal kits and perhaps not surprisingly alcohol. Restaurant spending is way down. Spending on traditional entertainment is down, but streaming services are way up. Travel and transportation and other sorts of commuting are, are way down. Shopping overall is down. Even healthcare expenses, um, despite the fact that this is a healthcare crisis, have tapered off because elective procedures at doctors and dentists have largely been put on hold or, or canceled for a while. But what all of this means is that you are likely able to spend less month to month on some things until life gets back to normal. Um, you are able to sock more money away. It, it's worth mentioning that the savings figures overall in this country have been really remarkable. Again, we're seeing a little bit of that show up in the survey results from tonight and in the information that Brett told me about how well many of the members of Redwood are doing. But the personal savings rate in this country, it's actually a statistic that is tracked month by month by the Federal Reserve. It's defined as the percentage of our discretionary income that we sock away. It doesn't include things like 401k contributions and HSA contributions. And in February, before this crisis really hit, the savings rate, the personal savings rate, which was at 6%, which is about where it's been hanging for the last few years. In March, it jumped to 13%. In April, it was 33%. Now, now, just to put that in perspective, the last time that we even came close to this number was in the mid-70s when we hit 17.5%. And of course, 33% is not sustainable. By May, we'd already fallen back by 10 percentage points. Now we're hanging out again in that 17% range. But I see opportunity in these numbers to continue to save a little bit more on a consistent basis. We have learned, thanks to COVID, what we really value and what we can live without. We have really surprised ourselves by cooking on a consistent basis, by going to the grocery store once a week or once every two weeks, which by necessity means that we are making lists and planning meals. We laid off the pricey gyms and started walking. And there is a great deal of savings to be had in maintaining some of these changes. There are also other savings that we may want to think about grabbing. In particular, I think everybody at this point should be looking at the number of subscriptions that are coming into our households. The average household now has 21 subscriptions. They cost us $240 a month, which is thousands a year. But because we've been spending so much time at home, we now know which of these we actually use and which ones we don't. And it's time to cancel the ones that we are not using. Now, of course, if you are struggling, if you have bills that you are simply unable to deal with right now, you may be wondering, what solutions lie ahead as the preventative measures that were put forward in the CARES Act begin to lapse and it remains unclear if the government is gonna do anything to replace them. Here's the overarching advice and it's my advice, but it, I know it's also your credit union's advice. If you've got bills that you can't pay, pick up the phone. I mean, these are the 
these are the the bottom line that that your mortgage under the cares act may still be suspended for under 12 months if it's fed for up to 12 months if it's federally backed that student loan payments are now on pause through the end of the year again those are federal student loans not private student loans but if you are having an issue pick up the phone and talk to your credit union i have heard brett say so many times over the years, there is nothing that Redwood won't do to help members. So pick up the phone if you need it and ask for help. Money move number three. If there is a silver lining to this crisis, it's that the cost of borrowing has gone down. It has gone down substantially. Right now, at Redwood, a person with excellent credit could refinance their mortgage at a 3% rate. That's a 5.5 adjustable rate mortgage. A 60-month used car loan at 2.5%. A credit card at 8.99%. That, by the way, is about half of the average. A home equity line of credit or HELOC at 4.5%. I mean, generally, we know it only makes sense to refinance a mortgage if you're going to hold the property long enough to make back the cost of doing the transaction. So you take your closing costs, you divide it by your monthly savings, and that's the minimum number of months that you need to stay in that home to make it work. But the rest of these transactions have a negligible cost. They are not at all demanding in terms of the paperwork that they require. And so even if you're just saving $15 a month on a car loan, over a year, that's $250. Over the time you have that car, it could be well over a thousand. It's worth adding these numbers up. One note of caution here, in the run-up to the Great Recession, we saw many people using home equity to consolidate their credit card bills. And the problem with this was that after they did so, 40% of those people charged their credit cards right back up. If you are going to take steps to save yourself money, in this way with the balance transfer on a credit card, make sure that you put a lid on any additional spending that you plan on doing in the future. Otherwise you risk falling into a hole that is twice as deep. Money rule number 73, you'll note sometimes I throw out some of my favorite money rules during a presentation like this. Just because someone will lend it to you doesn't mean you should borrow it. Um, that's just worth keeping in mind. And what if your credit isn't excellent? Or what if you're not sure? This is a really good time to focus on establishing some good credit habits. Here are the things that you need to do on a regular basis. First, you want to monitor your credit. Redwood provides credit reports and scores through Savvy Money. All you have to do is sign up for Savvy Money through Redwood, it is, it is free. Um, so make sure that you're keeping an eye on both your report and your score. That report is particularly important because one fifth of all credit reports have errors. And some of those errors are bad enough to actually drag down your score. So if you find an error on your credit report, reach out to the credit bureau that generated that report, file a report to have that error corrected, and that bureau has 30 to 45 days in which to get back to you. Build your credit. Building good credit is not rocket science. It's just a matter of good habits. You want to make sure that you are paying your bills on time every time. And you want to make particularly sure that you are keeping an eye on what's called your credit utilization. That's the percentage of the credit limit that you have that you're actually using. It's best for your credit score to keep it under 
Finally, if you know that you're not the kind of person who is going to monitor their credit on a regular basis, my suggestion would be that you actually freeze your credit with the credit bureaus. Um, crises like these bring scam artists out in droves and identity theft is a very, very popular scam. Knowing that your credit is frozen is a very nice and also free barrier that can help get in the way of full-blown identity theft by helping make sure that thieves can't obtain credit lines in your name. All right, so number four. Another thing that you want to do during this period is to take a look at your investment strategy and make sure that it is still appropriate for you and the amount of risk that you want to take in your life. How many of you are on Twitter? I imagine quite a few are probably on Twitter. I am on Twitter. I've got about 65,000 followers on Twitter. And what that means is that when I post something that really resonates, I get a couple hundred likes and maybe a couple dozen comments. Well, a while back, before the crisis, I posted something that got thousands of both. It went so viral that the Washington Post actually wrote about it. And it wasn't a cat picture and it wasn't anything about the president. It was actually retirement advice. So this was my original tweet. By the time you're 30, you want to aim to have one times your annual income set aside for retirement at 43 times, at 56 times, at 68 times, and by the time you retire, 10 times. And these guidelines, by the way, were developed by Fidelity Investments, but there's nothing unusual about them. Many financial institutions have ones that are very, very similar. But Twitter went nuts and not in a good way. These were the kinds of tweets that I received in response. David wrote, ah, There we go. David wrote, good advice. On a related note, does anyone know any handy recipes for leftover unicorn? And Michelle wanted to know how much room this left for the essentials in her budget, like avocado toast. And look, I got it. I, I understood. Because if you haven't started stashing money away yet for your future, the numbers that I laid out do look large, they, they may look unattainable. But if you can get yourself to the point where you are saving 15% a year, and that can include any matching dollars that you receive from your employer, you'll see that those numbers are absolutely within reach. And the bottom line is, most of us will need that much. The point of that retirement stash is to cover about 45% of your pre-retirement income in retirement. The rest will come from Social Security to get you to a replacement rate of income that you should be able to comfortably live on. Now, I should point out, if any of you are fortunate enough to have a traditional pension, you can save less by the amount that that will cover. But the point of looking at numbers like this is that it can inspire us to up our game. That's one big reason that we need to continually assess. So what do we do now in light of this crisis? Well, first, take a look at your 401k or your other retirement contributions. If you're in a cash crunch, it is far better to dial back on your contributions into your 401k than it is to pull money out either by withdrawing or by borrowing. And this is despite the provisions in the CARES Act that allow for penalty-free withdrawals and a doubling of the amount that you're able to borrow. And then 
when this crisis is all over and someday it will be over, focus on just getting that savings rate back up. Historically, we know that there are three things that determine how successful most investors are. The first and by far the most important is that savings rate. Socking away that 15%, again, including those matching dollars, will generally be enough to know that you can retire at 65 and with Social Security, replace about 80 to 85% of your income. Second and also hugely important is your asset allocation. That's the mix of investments, the stocks, the bonds, the cash that you choose to balance risk and reward. And years of research shows that this is responsible for about 90% of the return on your money. This is something that you want to look at right now. If the recent movements in the market mean that you are holding too much in stock, for the amount of risk that you want to be taking, that's something that you want to adjust. And if the recent movements in the market mean that you're holding too little in stock based on the amount of risk that you want to take, then you want to adjust that as well. The third factor on the list is the individual security selection, the individual stocks and bonds that you pick to fill out those positions. This is far, far less important. And, and that's because if you look back historically, the S&P 500 has gone up 10% on average since its inception. The Dow has gone up just a little bit less than that since its inception. If you are fine with results like that, and, and for the record, I am fine, with results like that, then all you have to do to be a successful investor is to put your money into low cost, highly diversified index funds or exchange traded funds that mimic the market in a proportion that makes sense for your age and your risk tolerance, and then you can call it a day. The sort of volatility that we're seeing in the markets right now though, can mess with this picture. I would like to venture a guess because I know that it's true of many of the people that I'm talking with on a regular basis, that some of you are getting stressed out by the markets right now, particularly those people who are probably five to 10 years away from retirement have been getting especially stressed out by the markets right now. If this is happening to you, don't take it personally. This is how we are all wired. We as human beings, we're just wired to survive the day. If, if you think about our caveman and our cavewoman ancestors, they, they were programmed to kill their prey and eat it immediately because they weren't sure when another meal was going to come wandering along. And unfortunately, we have not evolved as much as we might like to think. And what that means is that when we opt for delayed gratification rather than immediate gratification, making a good financial decision to save money rather than spend money, we are going against our own basic instincts and our brains don't really like that very much. This is something that we know because scientists, neuroeconomists are now able to use MRIs to look at our brains in the process of making choices about money. And what they see is that when something that we want comes into view, the pleasure centers in our brain, they light right up. And when we actually get the item, whatever it happens to be, we get a rush of the feel-good chemical dopamine. The, the trouble is that if you delay the availability of that item, even by as little as a day, you have to make the reward much, much larger in order to get that same pleasurable response from your brain. And things that are way off in the 
the future, like those retirements that we're all planning for, they don't light up our brains at all. And an entire academic discipline has developed to help us deal with this phenomenon. It's, it's called behavioral economics. I know many of you have probably heard of it. I Investopedia defines behavioral economics as the study of psychology as it relates to the economic decision-making processes of individuals and institutions. I prefer to think of it as the study of why smart people do stupid things with money. From behavioral economics, we have learned that we can help ourselves do the right thing by employing strategies that just help us get out of our own way. And the very best of these strategies is automation. Money rule number 11 is if you can't see it and you can't touch it, you won't spend it. Automation is the magic that makes 401k plans and other work-based retirement plans work. The money goes in to your account automatically and because you don't see it in your paycheck and it doesn't fall to the bottom of your checking account, you don't spend it. And the fact that there are nasty taxes and penalties involved if you pull the money out before age 59 and a half just provides another layer of encouragement to keep your hands off. So the key is to take this magic and apply it in other places of your life. Automate contributions at your credit union into IRAs and health savings accounts and 529 college savings plans. Put as many bills as you can on automatic pilot so that you know that you won't pay late because we know from the research again, that when people pay late, they don't just do it once. They tend to do it dozens or more times each year. And, and there are other financial maneuvers that you can automate as well. If you know that you are not the type of person who's going to rebalance the mix in their portfolio to make sure that their asset allocation is, line, is in line, you just put your money in a target date retirement fund instead. We have this technology now. We might as well use it. Money move number six, as we're working through this particular crisis, I have added this to the list of the rules I'm keeping. Um, make the best bad choices that you possibly can. This is not a time of easy choices. We are not choosing between chocolate cake and spinach. We are choosing between spinach and, and kale. And so the goal is when you have to make a move that you know is not the optimal financial move, make the best bad one that you can. For example, we talked about how it's better to stop contributing to your 401k than it is to pull money out. If you do have to pull money out under the CARES Act, you should know that withdrawing can actually be more beneficial than borrowing because the funds, as long as you repay them, can turn into a three-year interest-free loan. But be careful before you go down this, that road. And, and just remember that not having money in your account when the markets are rising is not in your best interest. Second of those bad choices, selling all your stocks when the market is falling is a bad move. Selling enough of them, just enough of them, so that you can sleep at night is a better one. Human beings have two biases, two innate biases. They're built in. We come with them that can really, really hurt us financially. One is a recency bias. We tend to think that whatever just happened is going to happen again really soon. The second is a bias toward action. Very hard for us to stay still. We just want to do something. And combined, those two things can be 
devastating in a volatile market. So let's say the markets drop several hundred points in a day. That's not hard to imagine. It happened a couple of days last week. And, and what happens in our minds is that we convince ourselves that this is going to happen again and again and again, so we sell. But instead, the markets rally, as they did, or they stand pat. The thing is, if you can't sleep, if you're feeling anxious about this, it probably won't work to do nothing. So instead, just take a smaller action to make yourself feel better. Move 5% of your money into cash and see if that's enough. If it isn't, move 10%, but try to stop it at that point rather than thinking that you have to be all out or all in. And finally, this is not the time to make big life changes like retiring or moving if you don't have to. Instead, try to buy yourself a little bit of time if you possibly can. Given what we think may be a looming recession, staying engaged at work until we understand what's going to happen and whether you have enough money to go the distance is probably a smart move. And finally, money move number seven, get help if you need it. This is not the time to stand on ceremony. It is the time to look for and ask for help. We have been publishing a lot of great content at Her Money, as well as podcasts on what is happening in the market, what is happening in the economy, as well as how to cope with the changes in your life. I hope that you will check them out at hermoney.com. Savvy Money publishes great content. Um, you receive that through Redwood, but your credit union is the most accessible and most terrific resource that you have. So pick up the phone, talk to a representative, ask your questions. You'll learn about all of the things that are available to you, the low loan rates and strong deposit rates. There are full service financial advisors that you can talk to. There are planning tools and budgeting tools on the website, financial counseling service, financial wellness resources. There is just a plethora of, of information um, right there for the taking. So I hope that if you need it, if you feel like you need it, you will just reach out and you'll get some actual help. And now um, I see Brett is back and he and I will be happy to take some of your questions. Thank you guys. Well, thank you, Jean. Um, great tips. I love those money moves. And I hope all of you watching are feeling a little more empowered and hopeful as you navigate your own personal financial journey and you got some, some, some takeaways. Uh, there's many takeaways in there. One of the things I want to clear up though is uh, on your credit report. So Redwood Credit Union provides all members a, a free credit score. It's in your online uh, banking and mobile banking. It's updated on a quarterly basis. You don't need to sign up for anything. It shows your history. It shows why your credit score is the way it is and uh, lots of education in there. So it's nothing to sign up for. It's there. You can go on oh, your oh, online sorry banking about that. right now. That's all right. Just, just for clarity purposes. Okay. Um, but uh, let's, we've got some time. Let's see. We've got, uh, we do have some time. That's good. I uh, want to do some questions uh, for Gene. We've been uh, getting some questions from some of our members. Um, and uh, so you, you went over a lot of great information, Gene, and you went over the importance of having a plan. However, some people heard your presentation may think that's all well and good, but having a financial plan is for people with significant income, not me. How would you coach them? I would say um, that financial planning has actually become much more democratic than it used to be. That, that idea that you have to have a ton of money in order to work with a financial planner or an advisor is kind of 1980s, maybe 1990s. Now help is there at a variety of prices, a variety of entry points, and 
it's kind of like therapy. I mean, you can sort of take as much of it or as little of it as you actually want. And if I go back to this screen, it it shows, I mean, you've got at, at the credit union, you've got full service financial advisors, but you also have financial counseling services. So you're, you're meeting members where they are. And I, and I also, I think that it actually, um, pays, if you don't mind my digressing for just a second, to explain the difference between financial counseling and financial advisors. Sometimes before people get into dealing with the investment portion of their financial lives, they've got to deal with the budget issues. The, the Let's make sure that we are spending less than we make on a regular basis so that we can get to that regular savings rate that I talked to. If that's a challenge, financial counseling is a really, really good entry point to get you to the point where you've got enough money that you're starting to invest that you can work with a financial advisor to get some advice about how to make that money go the distance. Yeah, I want to talk about both of those. I appreciate you going into detail there. So we, Redwood Credit Union has financial advisors, works with our members on their goals and, and their investments and, and helps them with retirement. But we do have financial counseling also. The bottom line is everybody in our branch and, and call centers doing financial counseling and our loan officers doing financial counseling on a daily basis. But we also um, pay for a program for all of our members. It's free. It's called Balance, and you can access that on our website. And Balance is, these are certified uh, financial counselors, people that have gone to college. This is all they do. And, and it's not just for if you're struggling and, and you're trying to pay off debt. It's, I want to buy a house. I want, I've got these goals. Um, budget tools, I mean, that's budget is certainly the, the where, where you start. If you don't know your money coming in and your money going out, uh, you really don't stand a chance here. And, and balance is a great tool. It's not a, it's a free tool for our members, but Redwood Credit Union pays for that service for our members. So just uh, please, please use these, these resources that we have. They're there um, and available to everybody. So thanks for going into detail on that, Gene. Let me go to um, the next question. What, uh, what kind of advice do you get from members who are working to pay off that debt while trying to preserve their savings? They've got these decisions um, and they're, they're struggling. How, how do I pay off the debt but save at the same time? So uh, my advice on this has changed a little bit in the pandemic. I think having an emergency stash is, is really, really crucial. It's, it's your insurance against going into more credit card debt. And so although... I am a big fan of paying off your credit cards as soon as you possibly can. Right now, I'd I'd make sure that you're hoarding at least a couple thousand dollars in cash before you start trying to really wail on those credit cards. But once you're there, I'm a fan of what we like to call call the debt avalanche rather than the debt snowball. So there are, there are a couple of different schools of thought here. Um, the debt snowball says that you pay off your debts in order of the smallest debt to the largest debt. And the theory there is that you get a psychological win from clearing that smallest credit card. I prefer the avalanche, which says you go after the highest interest rate first and then at, while making minimum payments on the rest, and then you work your way down to the lowest interest rate. And I, I just like that because numerically it's cheaper and it's faster. And I want to see people out of debt as soon as possible. Yeah. And you talked about refinancing rates are so extremely low. Um, we share a lot of stories at Redwood Credit Union and every single day we've got people in our, in our branches and our lending team sharing stories of people paying ridiculous rates on on credit cards and autos and even their homes that they don't need to. And how much, how much money we can save people by just sitting down and looking what you have elsewhere and bringing it here, whether it's consolidating debt or just refinancing it to these lower rates. It's uh, it's amazing how much we can save money on a monthly basis. It's uh, it's, it's life changing. Yeah, no, no question. And, and I also think you know, there, there's some people who, who know that their credit is not exactly where they would hope it would 
to be. This is just a continuum. I mean, we, we know we've been told by the Federal Reserve that rates are expected to stay low for a while. Um, and so don't panic if you think you don't have the credit to do that refi right now. Work on it for six months. The, these rates are very, very likely still going to be here or still be very, very close to here, and you'll be able to grab them then. And, and credit score, unfortunately, is not one of those things that moves overnight. But if you do adopt those good habits over six months, you will see it move. Yeah, I agree with you. Rates aren't going anywhere anytime soon. They're very low. Let's a uh, new question. What advice do you have for people who feel like they need to be doing something right now with their money? They just can't stand it. They need to do something. Um, something. There's so many somethings, right? I think, um, I'd like to see people driven by their own goals. So before you decide what your something is, sit down either with your spouse or partner or with a yellow legal pad and a pen and write down where you wanna be in a year, in five years and in 10 years. And then think about how you can use that sum of money that you wanna do something with to work toward one of those goals. Um, we gain a lot of, I, I write a, a, a newsletter um, every week. Uh, it goes out on, on Tuesdays. And yesterday I was writing about um, fatigue in, in coronavirus and how we're all feeling like this is just dragging, you know, and how do we stay motivated? Having a goal, Having having a goal and knowing what's what benchmarks you have to hit in order to get there keeps us going. It's it's a lot more about the process than it is about achieving the end result. So I'd say, you know, put your stake in the ground and then figure out how you can take the first step, first step toward it. Great advice. What about somebody, we, we go through this all the time here. We've got, uh, I, I tell people all the time, you want to be with Redwood Credit Union when bad things happen. And uh, a lot of bad things happen in life. Um, major transitions, they don't all have to be, be bad. They can be birth of a child and, and marriage, but you know, sometimes divorce, uh, death in the family, those types of things, major life transitions. And people find themselves in uncertain financial grounds. And what is your advice for those people? I mean, this is when you pick up the phone. I, you know my story because we've, we've talked about this before, but when I turned 40, I, um, I lost my father. I lost my um, job and I got divorced and I turned 40. So like that was four things all at once. And I, um, I, I put you know, two new people in my life. One was a financial advisor and the other was a therapist and I needed both of them very badly at, at that point. You know, when, when, when life hits us like this, we can't do it alone. Um, and so if, if you are dealing with financial uncertainty and you're not exactly sure what to do, then don't, don't move and regret it. Take the time to get some wise counsel about what the right thing is to do before you make a bad decision. Great advice. So Redwood Credit Union spends a lot of time out in our community. It's different these days uh, in high schools, teaching high school students, juniors and seniors about um, money and, and life. And they're kind of in the very beginning stages of, uh, of, lots of decisions, going to college. We call it bite of reality. Um, what advice would you give these juniors and seniors? And, and today we're still doing it, it's just via video. So we're still out there in the high schools, just not physically. What advice would you give the juniors and seniors who are thinking about college as their next step? What do they need to know? And then more importantly, probably some of their parents are, are on the, uh, the webcast right now. What do, what do parents and what do the student, students need to know? It's I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of this. They go out into the world and, and uh, if they don't understand what they're doing and they're not doing business with people they trust, there's a lot of people out there will, that will take advantage of them. So what, what's your advice for the juniors and seniors? I don't think um, 
we can look at college anymore without thinking of it as a value proposition. Uh, I think tuition inflation has gotten so far out of control that um, we really have to look at the economics of, of our decision on what school to accept as much as we have to look at, you know, the, the atmosphere on campus and, and everything else. Um, and, and that largely means applying to um, a, a range of schools that make sure to include schools that really would value having you on campus and would give you a significant amount of merit aid, aid that does not have to be repaid in order to be there. I also think that considering doing two years at a community college and then transferring those credits to a four-year school, which basically cuts the cost of college in half, is something that many, many more people should be considering. Great. Well, Jean, I want to thank you for your time. Uh, you're in New York. I know it's three hours later, so thanks for staying up late for us. Um, and uh, you... Uh, it's a great partnership we have with you. Your advice is uh, always appreciated and it's just great, great seeing you. Nice to see you too. And, and I hope everybody there is, is really hanging in there. We're thinking about you. Yeah, we're pretty, we're pretty resilient, so we are. So for the viewers, I hope you found this event beneficial. We appreciate you taking the time to educate yourselves and, and I, her, uh, her tips are certainly something that are, uh, uh, we can all benefit from. We are, if you'd like to view this webinar again, we've recorded it. Uh, we'll be posting, posting it on our RCU tube channel in the next couple of days. For some of you that may not know what an RCU YouTube channel is, we will be emailing, I would say no later than Monday, maybe Friday, both the link to this and we're going to, I'm gonna ask my team to send out the link to the stress management webinar. I, I, I think it's uh, something, again, I've watched it multiple times. It's one of those things that you can keep on looking, looking at and reviewing. And I think this financial uh, pr uh, presentation from Gene is one of those things. It's not a one-time thing. It's a great, great reminder. Um, also, the slide in front of you, a visit our RSU website. There is a ton of information. There's calculators, there's resources, there's videos, there's education for adults, for students. The balance program that I talked about is available there. Uh, counseling. It's it's uh, we put a lot of uh, a lot of effort into that, and those are all free. They're not free, but they're all things that uh, we pay for for our for our members. Um, so the information right there is is how to do that. RCU.org. You go into the financial wellness section at the top. It's pretty easy to get into. Um, the Online resources, the email that we send you though, one of the things I wanted to mention is I would love for you to pass that on, pass it on to friends and family. And um, I think everybody can use, you know, the impacts, the things that we're being impacted by. There's the uh, uh, mental well being and the financial well being. And, and I think that it'd be a great gift for you to share. Um, as a reminder to our members, we partner with hundreds of employers and nonprofits and schools throughout our communities and provide free financial wellness education. Hopefully that's something that uh, you are proud of, we are very proud of. Um, and because mental and financial wellness is, is it's a thing that we deal with here and uh, our members, employees and communities are important to us. With that, I'd like to leave with a few final thoughts. I hope that uh, you're leaving this event feeling a little more confident. Um, you know, some of the stuff Gene talked about, it's, uh, I've, I've, I've heard it before, but it's great reminders and, you know, it's putting yourself and in, in your particular situation uh, in mind as you're listening to her. And, and now you've got to do something. You can't just listen. You've got to go, go do something. I know we've endured a lot as a community for quite a while now, um, but I want you to remember that you're not alone. The good news is that history proves that we will get on the other side of this pandemic. We're going to get on the other side of the fires and, and the power outages. And, and as always, uh, we're going to be stronger for it. Redwood Credit Union is here for you, and we're proud to partner in helping you reach your financial goals and dreams. If you need something, give us a call. Stay well, and thank you for joining us.